Rugby League Back Chat is sponsored by TotalRL.com. Hello and welcome to this week's Back Chat from the Pitt Sports Bar in Leeds and an esteemed panel we have for you today. Danny Lockwood from League Weekly Newspaper, uh, Gary Hetherington who of course is the Chief Executive of the Leeds Rhinos and Martin Sadler from League Express uh, Newspaper as well, as amongst many other things as well, Total <laughs> Rugby League, all, all that stuff as well. Uh, right, let's start, we'll get on to the politics much later, don't worry, we'll be getting on to the politics but let's start <laughs> with the action on the field. Uh, top four, pretty much nailed on now. Huddersfield slipping up against Wakefield. I think it has been for quite some time, Dave. It was, it was nice to see that Huddersfield charge. It made things a little bit interesting. It shook up the eights a bit. Kind of gave the lie to the fact that there isn't a lot of life in 5-8. to eight. But uh, I thought w the, the story of the week was Wigan. Uh, I thought their performance at St. Helens really, really enlivened what is going to be a, a pretty enthralling climax to the season. That was a top draw. Uh, performance and I think when you see Sean O'Loughlin back on the field for Wigan it makes all the difference and if he stays fit for six weeks I think that is it and then of course uh, Castleford again all the bodies back Luke yeah. Hale, yeah. Ben yeah. Roberts, yeah. you know Grant Millington's one of my personal sort of heroes and <laughs> I think they're going to have a big say and as for the the Warrington debacle that whole produced it's um, that's that's shaming of the game yeah, I think great for Warrington and what, great yeah, I mean, for at the top of the minute top four it's only two from four isn't it well uh, yes I mean Wigan clearly their best performance of the season I thought yeah. I've not seen them play better all year they were absolutely brilliant against St Helens and, and really stamped their authority on the game Warrington what a great way to come back from losing at Wembley <coughs> I mean they were moaning a bit beforehand about the only five days gap between Wembley and, and that game but actually it did them a great deal of good because it allowed them to get that defeat out of their system well and truly very quickly but as, as Danny says what the heck has happened to Hull FC I, I've never seen a club collapse as badly as Hull have in the last seven weeks quite frankly you know they lost by 72 mm. points to 10 at Wakefield a few weeks ago 80 points to 10 against Warrington and, and they say it's because of injuries but you look at their starting third you know starting side and there are eight players you know with squad numbers 1 to 13 which suggests that they're not really they've not really got that many injuries mm. um, there's something really gone badly wrong there and Adam Pearson had a terrific <coughs> go at his players and more or less said they were going to ship them all off to Doncaster next yeah. year, which I think is a bit of an insult to Doncaster, really. He's not, I don't he's think not he meant only, it that way. He's not the only chief executive who's, uh, who's addressed the public when <laughs> things have not been going as well as they can. So, I mean, can you understand what's going on at Hull at the moment? Oh, it's clearly a difficult time for them, and it's in interesting that uh, you know last year's uh, Challenge Cup winners, Hull and the Champions League Rhinos, have both had poor seasons this year. Yeah. Uh, both went into this season with pretty much the same squads, the same coaching staff, and yet we came second and third last year. Uh, find ourselves in a, uh, having had a really poor season. I think the top four have done extremely well, and I think any one of those four, St Helens, have probably been the best side over the course of the season. Castleford, Warrington, and Wigan could all win it. It's a difficult to uh, pick. But the other eight teams in Super League have all disappointed with their performances over the course of the season, yeah. and that's what's not, that, that's been the failure of the of the of the Super Eights has been that in other big clubs like ourselves and all and other clubs have not challenged. Uh, Is that down uh, to injuries mainly, Gary, or, uh, or other things? Uh, injuries will always play a part, and some teams can have a particularly bad bad bad, bad run, and you, you get key players all injured at the same time. It's bound to have an effect, and it has had an effect at all uh, with the cells. Castleford have had a lot of injuries; they've seemed to come through it pretty good all season. Saint Helens had an injury-free run. Yeah. Uh, you know, it'll catch up on uh, them eventually. Uh, so th that is a. I think that's more a uh, an excuse rather than a reason. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, but look, I think there's such as the nature of Super League, any team can fall off the perch. Uh, I think that's, what, that's yeah. what impressed me about Wigan is the fact that they still had basically a full three-quarter line out. There. No mm. Don yeah. Manfredi, no John Bur Joe Burgess. They've really done it hard. There was no Tau Tai, there was no Liam Farrell still playing and yet they have found a way yeah, to cling to on them, to yeah. St Helens and now look like they're in the driving seat. There's one thing that really impresses me, talking, about, one thing that really impresses me about the Wigan culture and that is that when they have injuries they don't moan about it, they actually regard that as an opportunity for whoever's going to come in. I mean, th Friday night at St Helens was a great example because Sam Tompkins pulled out, you know, a quarter of an hour before the game and that young kid Oliver Partington came onto the bench, you know, you've got Askeray moving to full back 
and Escaray had a great game, I thought, and, and Young Partington did very well as well. And, and you know, they <laughs> took Tompkins' late injury in their stride without any trouble at all. And, yeah. and that's, that's the culture you've got to have, isn't it, I, I think. You know, whereas Hull, for example, I think Hull have tended to m moan about injuries perhaps a bit too much and, and have been, uh, you know, been fatalistic about the, the, the injuries they've suffered instead of saying, look, We've got these young kids coming through. Let's give them a chance and see what they can do. Okay, so the, the top four, the top four is more or less nailed on now. I mean, mathematically apart, but, but it's more or less nailed on now. Is there a danger that the season almost peters out before it starts again now, in terms of those top four? Well, they, it's a fascinating top four, isn't it? And you know, they're battling to, be for, to get that second place as well because that's uh, quite crucial to have the home uh, playoff place. Uh, but yeah, I think I think it's a fascinating top four. I think for the other five, other four teams, yes, it is. Uh, you know, they're there in many ways. They're trying to compete, trying to finish the season as strong as possible, mm. and of course, the building momentum uh, for next season. Uh, that, and it's unfortunate that, that, that that's the, the mix. If we compare ourselves to the NRL, you know, you look at the NRL top eight, and there's two points <coughs> separates the first and the eighth team, yeah. and it's a fascinating contest. And it's a fascinating, and you, any one of those well, eight can, yeah. all, can all. And you look at a team yeah. like North Queensland Cowboys that can come so close and be a, a top yeah. two yeah. or three team for season yeah. upon season, and just tumble down the ladder. Yeah. And they're not the only ones. And, yeah. and of course, I'm going to put this to you. I'm playing devil's advocate here. You talk about the eights, and I know you're a big advocate of the eights publicly. But if it'd been a top five system this year when that split came your club would still have a chance of getting the grand final this year the top five would have made it very interesting this year of course yeah and uh, you know I think the uh, the suggestion that had been put forward in previous years about uh, uh, the middle eights uh, I mean three of the top four teams actually securing a playoff mm. place and the fourth team not actually been number four but actually the best performing team in the yeah, would, the uh, that, that would have been a good uh, introduction uh, and yeah. innovation really and it would have really kept is that my one cool it was my one yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Out of the mouths of <laughs> right. So, so we'll, we'll, I mean, the interesting part of the season, the really fascinating part of the season, is yet to happen as far as the top four are concerned. But the middle eights at the moment, what I mean, is Headingley going to be ready for a million pound game? Because I mean, you could possibly be in a million pound game this year. Uh, yeah, uh, well, it's a fascinating uh, contest, and uh, you know, I think with the quality of the games that we've seen, have been very good. Uh, mm. I think you know, Toulouse are a really dangerous side. Toronto are pretty much a Super League squad. They're going to be dangerous. Uh, and and London uh, giving it the ball as well. So I think it's, I think when you look at the games and you know, the makeup of the games, there's a red edge about every game. And you know fans are not only looking at the team, their their own team's performance and results, they're looking at everybody else's as I well. I think if yeah. we if we're predicting who's going to be the million pound game, David, I'll I'll, I'll get get in first here and say so I think it's going to be Toronto and Toulouse right. who, who who play that game. I think Witness are you mm. know going to miss out, and I think London and Halifax will miss out. I think Leeds, despite Losing to Hull KR at the weekend, Leeds will be in the top three. They play Witness next, but, yeah. and they, they have a history of losing at Witness. That's a, that's a cru well, well, the so that could be that's a crucial. Well, that could be a big It could. I, I can't see that. It's tough to see where Witness are yeah. going to get. A, you know, yeah. they could buy all the raffle tickets and not win a well, prize. Well, let's, 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 <laughs> let's start at the bottom. Let's, let's discount that. Witness. Go. Yeah. If they if they don't beat Leeds this weekend, that's it. Then they've they've gone. Anyway. They've yeah. And even if they beat Leeds, million pound game at best. I think, yeah, I yeah. think you've, you've hit it on the you've hit the nail on the head, you and Martin. It, it, I think it's it's looking like that. It's going to be Leeds and OKR. It's going to be. Uh, it, Salford, going to be a, are, are Salford are, are I mean, already they, got already. Yeah. Fine. I think you've been premature there. Really? I think absolutely. Yeah. I think this week this weekend is a fascinating round of games. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Salford and Toronto. Uh, the, the Witness and Leeds game. It's a big game for us. It's a big mm. game for Witness. Mm. So there's a lot of edge about that. Uh, London and um, uh, and Toulouse as well. Yeah. What a fascinating yeah. game that is. So I think I think after this weekend there's a bit more certainty. But as we sit here after round three, I don't think there's any certainty. What at about all. that? What about that young uh, Hull KR kid, uh, Danny Maguire, Gary? He looks like a prospect. <laughs> Danny, you yeah, Danny's. Danny's. Uh, <laughs> you think he was a player? Yeah, you haven't got sweet, your eye on him for next year. A no? sweet uh, moment for for Danny and indeed uh, quite a lot of other former well, players yeah. players in the in the Hull KR ranks. Yeah, that was a, a big win for Kingston Rovers uh, uh, on Saturday. I, I always think Rob Mulhern looks a good player actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I was going to be. Go. Yeah, yeah, we produced that many players for the clubs. <laughs> you can't, can't keep them all. Uh, no. no, of course. Well, just talk about other players for, for clubs. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get on to this now. Um, we, we saw a situation this last week in the in the the, 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 the below the eights with the championship. Featherstone against mm -hmm. Lee. Featherstone took fourteen players. Yeah. Fourteen players. Featherstone Rovers um, to play against Lee. It was, it was at Featherstone, wasn't it? Are you? Do you play a part? Are you partly responsible for that? Because they've had this dual registration 
uh, with, with Leeds throughout the year. When push comes to shove, does that then leave a club like Featherstone denuded of players because they've relied so much on dual registration? Well, they've not relied that much on dual registration. That, the, the, the arrangement has worked extremely well and all our players who play for Featherstone, it certainly aids their personal development uh, no end. And of course, when they play for Featherstone, they, they, they assist Featherstone as well. So I don't think we've ever had more than two or three players in the Featherstone team. And it's typically that that's the number. Uh, the maximum is four anyway. Uh, uh, but um, we had a ridiculous situation this weekend where our players, we got players able to play for Ferguson, wanted to play for Ferguson, but the reg regulations prevented them from doing so. Why is that? What because they've got explain? to have played eight games. Right. Uh, they've got to have played eight games for Ferguson. But that's so the point that Dave's making, really, Gary, that, it, well, that, that they've uh, been that, hoist by their own uh, Yeah, and that's, that, that, in my view, that's a failure of the system. And, 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 mm. and it's these ridiculous regulations that, uh, that are preventing players from getting valuable experience. It's and for this to be able to use well, those I mean, that's, that's fair, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, if, if Featherstone were involved in a, in a crucial stage of the season and, and Leeds, you know, Leeds, say you were one of the four in the top eight that had nothing left to play for, then you could favour Featherstone by giving them some of your best players and, and that, that, would dis, that would disadvantage well, that, others. Well, that's the theory. But these players have been available all season. I, I, think, I think it's a fair point when it comes to the... Uh, the middle eights and if Featherstone had been in the middle eights clearly mm. there, there is a competition integrity issue sure. uh, but I think uh, the fact that they're not in the, the, the eights uh, players are available to play <laughs> for them but just weren't uh, uh, you know, the regulations uh, prevented them from doing isn't, so. Isn't the bigger problem and the bigger failing for the sport as a whole the fact that we don't have a reserve team structure that's well, at all functioning well, well. We don't have enough players and, and, that's, well, that's and we're told true. that it's coming back next year it, Leeds have always been a, a, a strongly opposite uh, opposed no. to it in recent years and uh, d do you really think that that is good for the game no we're, we're, we're in favor of reserves we've got a reserve team we've got a really high performing reserve team it's called our academy and that's producing players and that's where you know <laughs> F quite a but number of our players in the first team this year are all our I, academy I, I, players. I don't, I'm yeah, but, that, but, that. But, but, but actually, uh, what you're really doing is using dual registration as, as a reserve pool, aren't you? You know, with Feathers and with, with, with the players clubs. in the first team squad yeah. of 25 who are not selected, then mm. they, they need to play. And, sure. and, and in terms of their personal development, they want the best competition to play in, and that is indeed the championship. Mm. It's not in a reserve grade competition. Mm. Uh, that's the championship because the, it's the most important thing is their personal development then it, it, the, the dual reg arrangement actually ticks the box but no reserves is very topical uh, but and you know the, the RFL uh, should be leading this uh, the, this uh, the head of this issue well, the, the RFL have always said to be fair to them they've always said that they would prefer it if there was a reserve team system yeah but they don't want to push it because if clubs don't buy into it it wouldn't run properly so it needs the clubs to buy into yeah. it and it needs the hour fellas the game's good governing body to, to 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 provide answers to a lot of questions so for example uh where's all the players going to come from we're, we're now talking about the, the academy system caters for players up to the age of 19. Mm -hmm. so we're talking really about players beyond that 19 20 21 22. Sure. typically players who've come through the academy system but have not made a super league first team squad they tend to go and populate the championship yeah. but but you know if we introduce reserves then they will be retained by clubs presumably uh, but there's a load and loads of questions that the game needs to answer so where's all the players coming from first and foremost what impact will this have on the community game it mm. certainly have one because yeah. we would need to start getting trialists from, yeah. from, 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 sure. from open age. So it would certainly have an impact on, uh, on the community game. That needs to be explored. What about the financial well, issue <coughs> to both clubs and indeed the game to be able to service and, uh, and so fund the, the competition? The RFL answered well, these questions. Good question. Uh, yeah. well, it's a good question. They, 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 they've sort of glibly said, yeah, well, our policy is to introduce reserves, yeah. but they've not actually prepared all the, the groundwork as to what those implications would be, not only for Super League clubs, but for the Championship, for Division yeah. 1. Yeah. for the game generally because a lot of you talk to a lot of community game people now and they say actually the current system is leaving them short of players because the current system sucks players in that clubs like Leeds, Wigan, St Helens, whoever will suck players in at a certain age, 14, 15, sign them up to scholarships, take them all the way through and when they get to 19 go, no, we don't want you. And those kids are so disenfranchised, they don't go back to the community game. So they're being lost to the community game anyway. Yeah, that's only a very small number of players though, Dave. That's, right. that's only know. a very, very small number of players. Of, you'd find a lot of community club coaches that would take issue with that, Gary, that have seen a lot of players. I mean, I don't know if the answer is to switch to an 18s and 21s 
I think we've been there before, haven't we? Mm. Well, I, I, sure. I don't know if there is the an answer. The fundamental problem is we don't have enough players. Right, yeah. You know, yeah. And yeah. We're, oh, we're not retaining All the clubs players. are uh, fishing in the same ponds. The fundamental issue, and this is what, once again, you could question, is the rugby league d d doing what it needs to be, is participation, is getting numbers uh, increased and standards increased as well. So that is the fundamental push, and that's where the investment should be going, by Super League clubs in particular, and by the game generally. And then once we get to a situation like they've got in Australia where there's a wealth of players mm -hmm. then you actually can introduce a three-team system mm -hmm. if, if that's what you want. Gary I'm a great believer in, in, in the idea that if you're in if you're a Super League club you ought to have at least 10 community clubs below you feeding into you yeah. who have got kids playing rugby league in every age group from under sevens to under 19s so that you've got a massive number of kids to to draw on. absolutely and yet we don't seem to impose those standards do we we've, we've got some super league clubs that as far, you know have virtually no uh, junior absolutely. clubs below them and that that's just ridiculous and that's the fundamental issue yeah. really that's not being ta ta uh, sure. grasped yeah there's a big sure. there's a big issue with the community game uh, not least the seasons at the moment isn't there because a lot of community clubs feel that the summer season's not done them any favors because the kids are on holidays etc et sure. et it's a big big issue and i know the rfl are looking into that at the moment, that's as far as we go for part one of this week's back chat. We seem to have been picking on Gary Hetherington in part <laughs> one, so we're going to pick on Martin Sadler in part two. Join us after this break. Rugby League Back Chat is sponsored by TotalRL.com. Hello and welcome back to part two of Back Chat from the uh, Pitt Sports Bar in Leeds. Uh, as you can probably see, we've got an esteemable uh, panel with us today, Danny Lockwood, Martin Sadler and Gary Hetherington. Uh, right, politics, politics. Uh, let's get on to the politics, shall we? Don't switch off. Uh, Gary Hetherington, we've got a big meeting uh, next week, I think it is, 14th of September, when the whole future of the game is going to be decided. Fingers crossed. What's going to happen? I don't think it's just the future of the game, it's the league structure, isn't it? It's fundamentally the league structure that's been uh, voted upon. Uh, a proposal has been put forward by the RFL, which appears to have the support of Super League clubs, the majority of Super League clubs. And that proposal is what? Just uh, to, to change the league uh, structure next year for Super League uh, from what it is now onto a, a 12 team competition. Uh, with a uh, whereby you play each other home and away, you play a magic game, you then play six additional loop fixtures, mm -hmm. six other teams again. Uh, is a top five playoff to determine the, the grand finalists, and the bottom team is relegated. So no middle eights. Uh, uh, that is what how it <coughs> will affect Super League. Uh, championship, I'm not sure what would happen to Championship, but nobody's not well, sure. Well, they're talking about 14 clubs. I think they're talking stage. about this, that, and the other, but I don't think uh, anybody actually, uh, uh, there's a certain, I don't think there's a certainty about that. Uh, but it's, it's a significant change to what we have currently. That's the, that's the difference. And it, that does appear to have the sup, uh, support of the majority of Super League clubs, but it doesn't have the support of the Championship and Div Division 1. And clubs. it doesn't have your support either. You said, no. I think you're the only Super League club, aren't you, that's against this. Is that, is that fair? Well, I, I think our view has been consistent that we believe that uh, uh, there's a real opportunity here for, uh, for, for the game to start planning its future strategically. Mm. Uh, that should be led by the RFL, the governing body. Uh, it should include Robert Elston of Super League. It should include a, a representative from Championship Division One, and uh, and it should be a strategic plan that takes account of league structure, of promotion relegation, of financial distribution, a whole gamut of things. Uh, should actually be all in the mix, and ultimately you come up with an overall strategy, not doing things in isolation, promotion relegation. Uh, playoffs, etc., and that's that's been our point all along. And I think we're we're de we're rushing into we're, we're rushing into a change uh, that's not got the support of all the clubs. And yeah. uh, you know, from a uh, a games governing point of view, you know, I think a real disappointment that the RFL had an opportunity actually to grasp this and to lead it, but they've not done. The really sim simply acted as a mediator between yeah. the Super League and the Championship. The clubs. really crucial thing, Gary. I mean, the biggest issue the game faces really is not what happens next year. It's 
2022 Absolutely. onwards. You know, that's that's going to be the new TV contract, assuming there is one. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's r absolutely crucial for the future of the game mm -hmm. because with, without a compar comparable TV contract to the one that we've got now, you know, the game is in a bit of a mess really financially. Mm -hmm. So, you know, wh whatever, I mean, the money is guaranteed next year, isn't it? And yeah, up to yeah, 2021. Yeah. So, in, 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 in a sense, I mean, I, I, you know, the, the, this sort of dispute has been painted as a battle between you and Ian Lennigan. Um, and, and, and I've got a lot of sympathy for Ian Lennigan in, in the sense that I do agree with him, with him that Super League has got to be the, you know, the shining light of the game. And, and it clearly is. And, it, you know, it's got to be a, you know, it, it's got to be a, 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 you know, a competition that gets everybody excited, not least television broadcasters. Um, but the trouble is, as, as I say, you, nobody you, you, disagree with that. I don't yeah. think, Martin. I don't no. think anybody disagree with that. I think, but but you know, it is a game-wide competition. Sure. Uh, and we've got to be, you know, championship has been uh, invigorated. If, I think. I think it, we, we, if, the standards uh, have been. Say, uh, we've got to. We've, I think we've got to. Uh, we've got to be honest here. This is not about just improving the structure of of a competition. This is about the protectionism of the vast majority of the Super League clubs. Mm. It is a power grab. It always has been a power grab. They want a closed shop. They would have, they would, the, the, the problem that I see with, the, with what's on the table at the moment, Gary, is it's a one up, one down, and we're going back about 10, 12 years to when the team that gets relegated gets a parachute payment. So you've got a 13 so team Super League. So it comes straight back up again. You've yeah. a 13, te 13 team Super League with someone playing yo-yo rugby. And the championship clubs are left on the vine just a wither, and I, and, I, and, I, and I actually do not buy in at all to this structure as has been laid out. Yeah. Is anything other than a protectionism? Well, let, let's, let's, you, you say the championship's been reinvigorated because of the Super 8s. We've got a big club like Lee who look like they're facing financial meltdown. We've seen Featherstone, as we mentioned earlier, only turning up with 14 players. Again, financial in big financial trouble. These are very, what were, strong championship mm -hmm. clubs. Isn't it fair to say that, this, that, that the championship has been reinvigorated because we've had clubs like Toulouse and Toronto come into the fore? Yes, and I think what, because what the current system has done is encouraged investment, and because it's but clubs have tried investment. I mean, Lee and Featherstone well, have tried, yeah. and it's, and it's no, is this this is this, it, this system not encouraging over investment? Spend, spending well, money is speculation, actually, uh, Gary. Yeah, being, being over ambitious, and that's always that's I think that in sport that'll always be an issue. Uh, but I think what it has done is it's provided a pathway for clubs like Toronto, Toulouse, uh, Featherstone, Lee, anybody else for that matter. It's provided a pathway into Super League. Mm. And if if a club through the middle eights actually after seven games actually shows itself to be superior than a Super League club, that's fair enough. That's that's a good entry into Super League, and it's in, and it's encouraged that investment. But I think what the Championship and, and Division One clubs are fearful of, and quite rightly so, is that they have been abandoned by the RFL because yeah. going forward they need to be. Part of the game, of and course, they need yeah. to have a place to play. And and and, and Super League absolutely does need to be at the head of it, but it needs to be under one governing body, not yeah. separate governing bodies. Well, let's imagine, for sake of argument, that Toulouse and Toronto both get promoted this year, which is certainly a possibility. Mm. You then have a 12-team competition next year with three teams from overseas, which, in a sense, is a triumph for mm. the game. You know what a fantastic thing that would be. But I just wonder whether, if that happens, actually, what really ought to happen is. We go up to fourteen teams, well, you know, and and, well the, and bring the, the, two the teams the back the in. The proposal that Andrew Chalmers mooted the yeah, week before yeah, about a fourteen-team Super League. I think these loop fixtures are madness, Gary. So, yeah, I think well, we're, we're, we're we're it's this we're just killing. I think we're um, just over it's killing it's the not What you're suggesting, Matt, that should be part of a strategic yeah, thinking, yeah, yeah. Sure. and that needs to be explored. And I, would, I don't know the answer to it, and I don't think yeah. anybody does. But I think if, if Ralph Freeman from the RFL were leading this along with Robert Elston and the rep, that those are the sort of issues that they're meant to be looking at. Sure. So expansion, you know, if is 14 the right number? It's, it's it is the right number, provided you've got 14 strong clubs. But it, but the, that's why I say it's a big jigsaw. Yeah. And if you start dealing with things in isolation, then then it's going to impact on other other but, areas. But as I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I think we should be looking at a system to have 16 clubs in Super League from 2022. Personally, you know, because you, if you don't expand and get better and bring new new blood in, then you tend to stagnate. 
um, I, I would think. And you can do that if you you can do that, Matt. And if, if you've got if you're bringing in, pubs, if you're bringing yeah. in a new Jersey club, or yeah, you're bringing yeah. in teams like Toronto that are self-funding, they're not taking mm. out of the pot, they're adding to it. That's the problem we sure. have. It all comes down to money, pounds, shillings, yeah. and pence. Well, we, well, it I mean, comes we down to corporation as well, and that's yeah. what that's what we've not got. We don't have a, a group that's actually looking at uh, all aspects of the game. Well, there's no one empowered to do it. Well, you know, this this should be the job of the AFL. They are the yeah. governing body, and they've not done the job at all. They've they've simply acting as a media. Theater. They're yeah. looking at conjuring up a deal that they think might, might suit both parties. That's not the way to take out. Is that because is the Super League is threatening to walk away? Is there a case? Is there a case to be said that the meeting next Friday, there's an agreement next year that this is how the season looks, and it might be 12 team Super League, one up, one down, just for the sake of stability next year, and that long term approach is then addressed in the next 12 months. Instead of making a decision next week, saying this is how it's going to be from now on, you just make a decision for next year create a bit of stability and then the whole game can get together well, and that, look at it long term. Yeah, but but the the, 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 the Championship of Division 1 clubs won't buy that because why, why that's would depend, they not? That because they, are, they, they would be giving up on quite a lot uh, 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 of, the, of, of what they've actually got. They, they believe that what actually the, what's competitions in place and the television contract and everything that goes with it is, is a game-wide uh, Product and it's a get, and they've got some ownership in there. So there's a reluctance to just give up on that. But it's not giving up. If they say, right, let's park this. Let's say next year we're going to have 12 in Super League. We'll we'll have one up, one down. We'll have something to play for. But next year is a bit like when the centenary year we had a transitionary year to get into Super League. Is there not a case to be said we have a transitionary year next year? We still make it meaningful, but we have a transitionary year so that the whole game, instead of saying like we've got a week to sort this out. The whole game can say, right, this is this is how we work together for the long term future. Yeah, and that, that's, that's wishful thinking, Dave. We've, isn't we've it? had a in year. The league. <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that, that's an admission <laughs> of failure, in my view. Uh, I think yeah. you know. I think we've we'll also said we can't do it hurriedly. And if we are to sort a long term future out now, it's going to be by definition hurriedly. But by definition, you stick with what you've got. This mm. was a seven year arrangement. Yeah. This was mm. a seven year agreement, mm. uh, with, with, albeit with a review after three. But this was a seven year agreement, and one, one section of uh, uh, the Championship of Division saying, We like it. We don't want to change it. There, there, there lies the conflict. So rather than rushing headlong into trying to change something for next season, which might then change again, and that, what sort of stability is that? Uh, they're, they're, they're just, uh, that that's the that, that's the st st strategic planning that's lacking that needs yeah. to be in place and it's mm. still, there's still no evidence of it and there is also this factor that came out at the week and that emerged which I haven't been aware of the fact that the middle eight is the property of the RFL mm. yeah. and that is a, a quite a, 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 a valuable financial property well, uh, uh, where, where uh, do they get their income from because <coughs> the clubs are the clubs, you're no, keeping it's, it's an you RFL mean. decision and that's why they're not getting any income from it though, are they they are no, they are for a little bit of income, but I mean they are responsible for the wider interests of the game, uh, and they, they are for have got a difficulty at present because on the one hand they've got Super League telling them that they're, not, they're dissatisfied with with their servicing of the game, so Super League are wanting to create their own executive mm. and take away. Uh, a lot of the sort of function and the powers of the AFL and the AFL ha seem to be happy to actually do that. So it's coming uh, yeah. and, and it's one less job for them to do. And they've also got the AFL have also got the championship and division, division one club saying to the AFL, hey, we're dependent on you to protect our interests yeah. and you're not doing so. You're, you're in me, danger of abandoning us. It sounds to me, Gary, as though you're very critical of Ralph Rimmer, the chief executive, and, and mm. Brian Barwick, the chairman. Well, of, I, think of, Ralph of a, I think Ralph has done a really good job in under really difficult circumstances. Yeah. I think there's a really big question mark on the AFL board of directors. They are yeah. the governing body. I think the I think they the seem system, silent, don't the they? system of governance that we have in place is fine. We put it in 15, 16 years ago. It's an independent governance. Uh, it, it's there to protect the wider interests of the game. The Super League clubs have been dissatisfied. I think not so much with the system, but more with their performance. Mm. Uh, and I think that that's ongoing. And so I think that they find themselves in a great deal of difficulty because at present they're not satisfying anybody. Can I what? just play devil's advocate here yeah. and say, we look at the middle eights and say it's fantastic, and it is, but realistically we can't afford, I'm not saying this because you're here, we can't afford Leeds to be relegated. We can't afford two, three big clubs yeah. under real pressure being relegated next year. And when you realistically look at the top four in the championship, you've got Halifax who punched above the weight, but I think yeah. by their own admission would say, we're not a Super League club yeah. yet. I think London Broncos would say, we're not quite ready yet. Yeah. Toulouse have admitted that plan A is to be in the championship next year. Realistically, only Toronto are geared for and are 
hungry for Super League next yeah. year. So is it not well, creating a kind of a false situation? Yeah, I think the 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 does the need to be changed. Uh, it's not perfect and never were going to be perfect. Uh, and uh, yeah, the system is not been designed to actually relegate the ninth club in Super League, for no. example. But you could be really. You I could could be really absolutely, I, absolutely, that's the, that's the jeopardy. That's that sport. Yeah, I, sure. I do still think that we're talking around the bigger problem or the bigger issue, yeah. which is the fact that the Super League clubs that are greedy for more power, for more money, for more money, for, for more influence, for more out of the pot, are not growing their own businesses. Mm -hmm. They're not thriving or expanding in their own marketplaces, and yet so the RFL as ever has been, is just dead easy to sit there and be, have fingers pointed at it and blame for this and you don't market us and you don't do this and yet I don't look around and, and your clubs along with Wigan is probably the, the best tool Gary but even so they're not growing the crowds, they're not they're you know, declining they're not, actually they, they, they are, they are yeah, and, and, the and, and Martin and I sit in the trade press and we have to deal with these clubs and it gets ever 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 more difficult to deal yeah. with them because they become more insular more isolationist they treat everybody outside of their own narrow boundary as enemies and I just and I despair for the future of the game when its leaders its brains trust can only all they can do is say, well, we're going to rob the lower divisions for now, and we just want all the power off you guys. Oh, that's a good point, uh, uh, Danny. Really good point. You know, the growth of the game actually needs to come from the clubs themselves. Yep. Every club needs to grow its business, grow its fan base, grow its, improve its facilities, improve its play production. That's where the growth is going to come from. But it needs a lot but of help it, it centrally, needs, Gary. Too many it? of us are, are quite happy to look at a governing body and blame them yep. for the lack yeah. of growth. It's a chicken and egg. Either, but but the, the starting point is the clubs themselves. Uh, and there's not been anywhere near enough growth, certainly the last 10 years. No. But, 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 but rugby league is very bad about talking about itself positively. I mean, for example, at, at the weekend, if you watched most of the games, there were some incredible try scored. You know, you, you look back at Tommy Makinson's try for Saints against Wigan, Oliver Gildart's try in response, absolutely tremendous. Gr some great tries at, at your game on Saturday, some great ones at Warrington, great ones all over the place. And yet, you know, we end up talking about the politics inevitably. What we again. do, because that's rather what that's what we yeah, do. That's what we, we do, talk about crowds at Wembley ahead of the game, and, yeah, yeah, and, and that's all forgotten yeah. because it's a great game you know, on the field. But, but, but somebody, just, somebody's well, got we're, to pr promoting those achievements. We're just coming towards the end of this of this part. So a final word. Uh, Gary Hetherington, Chief Executive of Leeds Rhinos, uh, what's going to be the outcome next week? What do you think? What do you want to be the outcome, and what do you think will be the outcome next week? Uh, I would want the outcome to be stability and I think stability is to take some time about the, uh, what is a huge decision for the game. Uh, I think they have a fellow looking for a decision uh, and they may well get one and I'm not sure which way it'll go. Right, but we need to know what the structure is next year. Of course we do. Sooner than rather than later. <laughs> so We've not got a lot of time to play with. <laughs> well, I think the meeting next week will probably determine it. Yeah. Are you confident? Um, I'd like to think I was but I think that uh, I, I fear, I fear that there'll be a, another fudge and there'll just be more dissent soon and we'll just be building the problem for later. I suspect the Super League clubs will get their own way because they'll get enough championship clubs supporting them to, to get it passed. Okay, well we shall see. Uh, make sure you, uh, you watch all the news outlets in the next week or so because that's going to be a big story breaking in Rugby League. September the 14th I think it is, isn't it? So look out for that. That's it for part two of Bat Chat. We're, uh, we're back with a third and final part in just a few moments time. Rugby League Back Chat is sponsored by TotalRL.com. Hello and welcome back to the third and final part of this week's Bat Chat from the Pitts uh, Sports Bar in Leeds. Danny Lockwood, Martin Sadler and Gary Hetherington with us this week. We're parking the politics. We'll be back on that in weeks to come, no doubt. Uh, but let's talk about expansion because there's an interesting story this week. Um, Gary Carter in the Sun newspaper talking about the Dublin Blues <coughs> possibly applying for League One next year. We've got Red Star Belgrade. We'd have laughed all these off 
a couple of years ago, but because of Toronto and because Catalan Dragons win at Wembley, suddenly we take these a little more seriously. Are we daft to take these things seriously, or is no, this the future, Martin Seven? We've we, we, we've got to be looking for expansion where we where we can find it. And I mean, I I, I feel pretty sympathetic to um, the Dublin Blues because of my own Irish antecedents in my own family. I'd love to see. Um, uh, uh, you know, an Irish team in, in, in rugby league and I think the Irish actually are just great sportsmen and rugby league is a sort of physical game that, you know, Irish people I think would love if they ever got to see it, you know, at, at, um, at, at its best and, uh, but you know, I don't, I don't know a great deal about this Dublin Blues proposal, David, so, you know, it remains to be seen what it really comprises, well, whether they've got any financial support I, that would I, make it viable. I think it makes great reading for now. Um, it's, it's a nice soundbite. I think the problem is, and I'm equally fond of the Dublin Blues, I played against them in 1993. So that tells you how long the Dublin Blues. Dublin <laughs> 57. I was, yeah. <laughs> I, was played, I, I played against for Dewsbury Celtic Dublin Blues in Dublin in 1993. But the thing is this, it's all about the money. And we're talking about expansion, which is great. And if a team like Toronto can come in self-funded, and by the way, which I think that Catalan should be doing and Toulouse should be doing too. But if a team can come in and bring something to the game, that's one thing, Dave. But we've seen expansion, I think, fail. It's particularly at the lower reaches of League One level. We've seen it with what happened with Oxford University of all, all, all goals in Gloucestershire. We've got clubs that are expansionist clubs on our own doorstep that are struggling mm. and are taking money out of the pot. Now, that's not to say that they aren't worthy projects that we need to persevere with, but all I'm saying is if we're going to throw the net ever wider, we've g there's got to be a solid business plan that underpins them and makes sense of them because who's going to pay for a League One team to go over to Belgrade or go over to Dublin, you know, when, when they're struggling at the moment. Well, Dublin would be easier than Belgrade. Yeah. Well, it, well, of course yeah. it would, but at the yeah. moment, some of these clubs are bringing lads down the motorway from Dewsbury yeah. and from Castleford to pull them off. I mean, you, you've been involved in, in expansion clubs, obviously, with Sheffield Eagles, mm. and before that, you played at Kent and Victor. So, what do you make of yeah, the um, current mood? Uh, and, you know, the starting point is actually what do we want to try and achieve and what is possible? Uh, and we've never really grasped that, uh, that, that question. Uh, and also, as a game, we've never had a, a, a strategy for expansion and we've never had any resource to actually, first of all, undertake uh, some fact-finding. Mm. Uh, you know, what is the true, uh, you know, what is the, uh, the, uh, the support base and the, the market research and the financial backing and everything else. So that, 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 that's critical to be able to do all that. Mm. Uh, and I think you know, there needs to be some research into where are the areas where the game could thrive. Uh, Dublin might be one of them, but so you need that sort of resource, and we don't appear, appear to have, have it. Have we ever done any research no, going into so. our I audience, so. for example? As a game, we've never had any, yeah. had any policy yeah. on, on, and then when clubs have come in, we basically leave it to their own resources to yeah. see, see, see how we go. And uh, so there's not really been a support mechanism to help them to get to where they need to get to. It's been the cart so leading the horse. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's been to totally lack of... Uh, mm. uh, it's uh, it's uh, kind of the rugby league paranoia, isn't it? Ever since 1895, we're not yeah. just a northern sport, we yeah. can go anywhere. So anytime someone says, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, everyone, we go, yeah, we'll embrace that because okay. we're so desperate to expand. I don't think don't there's don't a real desperate. opportunity in France, though. I think yeah. the, you know, yeah. the Catalans winning, the, 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 the national uh, coverage that they've got, uh, rugby is a big game in France, albeit rugby. Do you think we should take the 2025 World Cup there if, I think if, there should be if a, America's going to fall through? I think there should be a strategy for France. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that may include inc encouraging other clubs to come into the competition self funded yeah, yeah. uh, And encourage, them, encourage uh, clubs to actually look at this as a viable op op option. Uh, and if, if indeed they come along, well then we can assess it. If they don't yeah. come along, well they don't. But I think, that, I think there should be a, a, an actual strategy for, for France. Yeah. And you know, I could see up to three or four teams coming and populating it's an expanded Super League, mm. albeit self-funded. Is that France's job to do It so? is, and we really need yeah. the French to do it. There was a reluctance for the for them yeah. to allow the English we, to come we, and do it. We can't hold we the hands the French, forever. And anyway. I think the Catalans have got a real big role to play here. Sure. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity. I think we've oh, no doubt. with the Catalan success, there's a bit that's presented an opportunity. Not just France, Northern Spain, of course, Catalonia itself. I mean, you know, last week the president of um, uh, Catalonia visited the Catalan Dragons mm. and congratulated them on their success and they've, mm. it's well known that they're going to go and parade the Challenge Cup at a Barcelona 
home game at the Nou Camp. And I mean, it has made a significant impact in, yeah, yeah. in that part of the world. And maybe it does, as Gary said, maybe it does excite that sudden ambition because, I mean, we forget yes. when Catalan applied to come in, Villeneuve and Toulouse were also applying to come in. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. And that ambition has, has maybe dimmed a little. But, you know, I mean, well, when not you look at Toulouse's the Catalan case. players, when you look at the Catalan players, there's very few of them from Perpignan. They're from, from Villeneuve. They're from mm. Avignon. They're from, so there, there is obviously a strength. It's a regional team, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe, you know, I know we've, we've grappled with Cumbria uh, for, for many, many years, but I think if, if, you, if the Cumbrians could look at the model that uh, the Catalans mm. have created, and they are a team of the region, uh, which was the coming together of some clubs to create to, to create the Catalan Dragons, and they, they, they are now a big business and mm. a successful team as they've just won the Challenge Cup, and they've got real opportunity going forward. Yeah. Uh, and maybe there are some lessons for our own... Uh, uh, but it does all come back down to simple economics, and that is why the, yeah. I still think that, such as we can hang our cap on a, on a great expansion model, yeah. it is Toronto right now, I think that's the good news story, I'd love to see them get into Super League, that yeah. would encourage other people, but when like, like the, the suddenly quiet New York or New Jersey franchise, Dave, yeah. to revisit the situation and, and perhaps to look at growth like when that. When you say it's down to economics, what it's really down to, you know, is an extension of that idea, is finding people like David Argyle, sure. billionaires, right. who yeah. are prepared to finance clubs. Because we, we talk yeah. about expansion. If we can't find people like him and interest people like him uh, in, in, in owning a club, I mean, he came out of nowhere, as, yeah. far, as, I, yeah. as far as I can see. And, you know, with this idea to set up this club with, with, with Eric Perez over there, I mean, you know, if we can find ten more people like him, and, and that's, we'll and be that laughing, won't we? And that is modern professional sport. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. And I think in France, those those ten or maybe even two or three, uh, uh, findable. Just, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, 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 the country of France has fallen in the rugby league with twice before, hasn't it? In the 1930s, it fell in with rugby league. Yes, of course. The Vichy government, but then it fell in love again in the 1950s. The 1951 yeah. tour to Australia yeah. when they yeah. beat everyone, the whole country was behind it again. So maybe there is a third wave coming. Oh, well, there's an opportunity now. Yeah. Viva la France. Yeah. 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 Can we yeah. get in with Brexit now? And this is a good point that Gary says about Cumbria as well, in that you know people forget. I mean, we were reminded of it this last week or two that the Catalan Dragons are two rival clubs. This is like Hull and Hull Kingston yeah. Rovers, St Helens and Wigan, who came together but made it work because it had a Catalan feel That's to right. it and they were all Catalonians. Cumbria could do the same. Uh, and we're a Cumbrian <laughs> club. And I, all right, Whitehaven and Wigan. The, the, the problem could. is that your power base is out in West Cumbria, Cumbria isn't it? And there yeah. are, there are, one, there, isn't, there aren't a lot of people. Yes, we know they can fill the yeah. ground with five or six thousand for a Scotland game when they're playing the World Cup, of, you know, the Four Nations. Carlisle never really kind of cracked it, did they? No. Uh, uh, so it, I think there is also that other economic dynamic, not just the, the man writing the cheques, but where you draw your people from. Sure. Mm. In the 1950s, Workington were able to draw people from all over uh, Cumberland, as it then was, you know, from <coughs> places like Keswick and, and beyond. And they used to get regular five-figure crowds. You know, they won the Challenge Cup mm -hmm. in 1952, didn't they, with Gus Risman playing yeah. at the age of 41. It was an incredible success story. They, they won the Cup quicker in terms of their own existence than the Catalans have done, in fact, you know, because they only came, came into existence after the war. But the fact is that, you know, you've got two clubs in West Cumbria that, are, you know, have a, an enmity, really, I suppose. They, they'll never come together. And Why the, not? There comes Why a point, not? Well, because if Sanistev... And well, I don't uh, think there was the same enmity in There was. In, in there was they, they, you had Sanestev and Tres Catalan. Who, uh, you speak to Bernard Guache about mm. this, and he, mm. he, when he first started it, he said he didn't think it would work, and he was no. amazed that it did work. But, but the reason it worked was because they were Catalans. But with mm. even, were even, with all sure. the, even with all the parochial passion, Dave, yeah. those clubs are still struggling to get a four-figure yeah. crowd. Sure. They've got to get a new audience. And, exactly. so, and, and so to build that, you, 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 you know, it's okay saying build it and they will come. Well, where are they? You would need not coming right now. Sanestev and Catalan and, and Trent's Catalan got together was because both those clubs were dying. Oh, they were dying yeah, to death. Yeah. And that's why they came together. That's what well, maybe that's provoked it. It is the Cumbrian. Do you need a David Argyle, a Cumbrian David Argyle? I don't think it, there is it, one. That's no, the problem. That's the problem. Isn't Marlon Cook, actually? Yeah. 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 You know, it actually has to come from the Cumbrian. It, in, indeed. Yeah. Support from the game. Indeed. Yeah. 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 Everybody would love to see it because there's a place in the heart. There does sometimes come a point where you've got to recognise your own limitations and perhaps Workington and Whitehaven can always thrive in a part-time environment. But to go beyond that is, you know, the way they're established at the moment is just beyond them. I think Workington, by the way, 
did some really great stuff in promoting their game against yeah. York yeah. at the weekend. They took on, you know, went on to social media and, and were really smart in some of the things that yeah. they did. But they still only got a crowd of about 1,500. Mm. You know, so, so, you know, despite all that, y y you know, you can only be successful to a limited degree I, I think if with a small population. If it, was going to, if it was going to work, you'd almost have to come on top of Whitehaven and Workington yeah. and they would have to support the mm, bigger entity. They would have to get together. The, the, yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. One way or another. Think, one way or another. Well, they'd, have to they'd have to collaborate. Or by yeah. They'd have to yeah. collaborate almost as the feeder clubs of yeah. the mm. new Cumbria. Yeah. yeah. And of course, it needs a venue. It needs a stadium. Well, they're talking. Yeah. I mean, they've been talking about that for some while, haven't they? Up in Copeland. Yeah. 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 So it's not going to happen next year. No. So <laughs> well, no. <laughs> That's too quick. Uh, so we could have a doubt in Cumbria. We could have a doubt in Toulouse. A doubt in Perpignan. We could be going to Toronto. No one's going to want to pay to go to Wembley next year. We're going to have so many great doubts days out in rugby league that no one's actually going to uh, going to want to to uh, to do that. Is there a danger also though that if you're if you're including clubs like uh, Red Star Belgrade, for example, and and they don't bring TV deals with them, you're actually watering down because the broadcasters yeah. over here are not going to be as as interested in paying for put, playing yeah. out in. Yep, and, yeah. that, and that's got to be you know that's the starting point. Yeah. What is the what is the uh, what's the attraction of actually uh, uh, encouraging overseas uh, new clubs? And part of it's got to be to to grow the profile, to grow the yeah. fan base, but to grow the commerciality, and, also and not least, least to grow the international game, game, Gary. That's uh, that's yeah. another factor. Which you know, and there's a lot of good work going on with that, uh, and some encouraging news about the Tonga Australia test yeah. and mm. that's coming up. But I also think that we have to look beyond, not to go back quite to the politics and everything. But to what the, the financial landscape is going to look like beyond 2021, are we going to still be in a Sky TV or a whatever well, TV deal? Are we going to be looking at streaming? Because it is a, it is a fast moving landscape. It is, but we should be confident uh, and quite bullish about what we're capable of doing. You know, yeah. We have a very good television product. Uh, we've got a very loyal uh, fan base uh, in terms of... Uh, and so I think we've got a lot of advantages. So I think there's a lot of no negative uh, talk about what we, we might not do and, this, and, and the mm. threats. But actually, we need to be much more bullish about what we're capable of and what yeah. we've got to offer. Not and that's sure. why we've got to get our own act together because everybody's looking at everybody's looking at this from the outside, the broadcasters, uh, the sponsors, etc. Uh, and you know, our challenge is to get our own act together mm. uh, first and foremost, and then to be able to promote what what, what all the benefits of an association with Super League and Rugby League. Carry the um, Eddie Hearn and. And, and his father Barry were at the Challenge Cup final. Yeah. Do you see a role for them in rugby league in any well, way? I, I think you know. I, I think first of all we have to come together as a game, yeah. some, which we're not at present. Yeah. To come together again, and you know that's why I believe that you know the chief, the, the, the chief executive of the AFL, Ralph Rimmer, along with Robert Elston, along with the representative, they should be the core of a strategic group, and then they should be able to pull in anybody else that they feel can add value, mm. and somebody like an idiot could add value. Clearly, your, your TV broadcasting would need to be part of that. We need market research information to be part of that. So that core group should be the strategic think tank for our game going forward. And that should be led by the RFL. So far, it's not done that job. Mm. And that's the disappointment at the RFL. It's not grasped the opportunity and it's leaving a divided game. Uh, and it needs to be much more efficient in, its, in what it's doing itself. Without sounding like I'm banging the drum, because I am banging the drum, Challenge Cup is that is that on the uh, agenda? Next well, it should be. That's, that's a huge. Is it, is, it, is it not then? No, I don't think so. But right. it, you know, that, that's a huge uh, uh, asset to our game, sure. which we are we are eroding year on year. And the the fault fault lies with us, the clubs, mm. and, and with, the, with the governing body. There's not a strategic plan to actually uh, reinvigorate the mm. Challenge Cup. The whole thing needs to be looked at again, uh, and we need to restore it as a major event and a major competition. Well, how, how would you do, you do that, Gary? I think that that's probably for another another TV program. But yeah. I think what we've got to do is is first of all we've got to get the game to take ownership of it. So we we're all guilty of not necessarily attending the Challenge Cup. Years gone by, I've been to forty five consecutive Challenge well, Cups. Well, well, I'll, I'll exclude <laughs> the other. <Dave>. But <laughs> as a game, Since we all used to embrace. <laughs> we all used to embrace the Challenge Cup final. So uh, people from all sections of the game, mm. the community game, from uh, uh, clubs who were not in the elite, all used to converge well, well, and, why do you think and that support. Stopped? 
I think there's a number of reasons. Uh, I mean, there's a change in social habits, and I think mm. you know, going to Wembley and, and going to London is not the sort of special occasion that it used to be. But that, that's where we've got to start. We've all got to actually go <laughs> start attending. Yeah, and getting but also, all our calendar. Calendar. It's it's the calendar. And the then calendar we have to find. Is a well, then have to find the new audience as well. The yeah. event well, the new, audience, the new as audience. I think the new audience is key because it's all right, very well saying, oh, we all need to start attending, but we're already asking rugby league fans to pay for a grand final to but go to the Magic don't, Weekend we're not to take trips to Perth. Then, then we can hardly expect anybody. Else. People, can't the fact is, people can't afford The to. fact is we're just not expanding our audience, Gary. Yeah. You know, it's okay saying that fans ought to go, but the fans are declining in, in real terms, I think. And, you know, we need to, you know, really inspire a new audience of young people somehow. And, and but then, the and then that brings us back, and we know we said that it's dead easy to point fingers at the RFL and say it's all your fault. But the fact is that in terms of... <laughs> in terms of the fact is it is. Is, 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 is there a marketing director? In the yeah. sport, oh God. yeah, there is yeah. marketing. Yeah, yeah. but well, I think well, and the fact that I'm asking it, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right. Gives you, gives you a clue as to what yeah, yeah. part of the problem is, yeah. because there's amidst all this political term, turmoil, there is a, a stasis in terms of addressing the real core problems. Yeah. I personally think that moving the Thomas Cup in the calendar would be the first start. But there's this bigger, pr bigger issues. Is we're going to have to stop you there because we're right out of time. Unfortunately, we could have had twice as many programmes, not got it all in. Quick reminder of where you can find out what's happening on this channel. There you go, at www.freesports.tv. But thanks as ever to our panel, to uh, Danny Lockwood, to Martin Sadler and to Gary Hetherington. And we'll see you next time for Back Chat. Goodbye. Rugby League Back Chat is sponsored by TotalRL.com.